This talk will be on the module four for IS735. This is specifically about graph mining and social media. Before we get into the material for the module, a few logistics about semester assignments and the semester project. Uh, first, regarding the semester project, note that I have again extended the data collection report from October 2nd to October 5th and then October 5th to October 12th. Uh, the primary reason for this is I realized October 5th was conflicting with a, an assignment due next week and I'd rather have you give the time to your assignment and then be able to do the data collection report following on from that assignment, especially if you're using the data from your semester project for assignment two. Regarding assignment one, so I'm still working on grading these, but overall looking at the medium publication for the class, I'm actually quite happy with however how most everybody did. And if we look at the statistics for the class, the, I generated these a, a bit ago, we actually see that we're seeing a number of views and reads and a pretty decent read ratio for the posts that you all have made. So overall, good job. Uh, the one thing I'll note is many of you relied on word clouds for your visualizations. Uh, I would prefer you not do that. I have a nice, uh, I've linked to a nice post about why I'm not a huge fan of word cloud. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, as mentioned, I won't take anything off for assignment one, but know that I am uh, unhappy with word clouds going forward. Regarding assignment two, that's due a week from today. That's building graphs from social media data. And then assignment three is due in three weeks. Note this assignment is set up by this module. So we'll talk about the tools for doing graph mining, uh, which you'll then use for assignment three in a few weeks. Lastly, you have your ethics presentation. Note the first two of these presentations are due on September 28th when these slides go live. Uh, for people who are creating these presentations, just go to the student-led ethics presentations discussion forum and reply to the top level to post your content. Uh, for other students who have not who are not responsible for ethics presentations this week, note that you all are expected to comment on at least four other students' ethics presentations throughout the semester. This is part of your participation grade. Uh, to avoid any sort of issue with timing and give the opportunity to our presenters to respond to comments in a reasonable time frame, uh, please have your comments within 72 hours of the presentation being posted uh, to give your fellow students time to respond. And this way we won't have timing issues where everybody starts trying to comment on other people's ethics presentations at the end of the semester. So if you don't get your comments in within the first 72 hours, I mean, you're certainly welcome to continue the discussion, but note you won't be graded or you will not receive credit for comments that are made more than three days out. To post your comments, simply just reply to the presentation for that particular student. All right, so now moving into the material for graph mining. We have four primary learning objectives. The first is to define and use homophily to extract insights from graphs. Then we'll describe three types of graph mining tasks. We'll implement and evaluate graph mining techniques, and you'll be able to explain an ethical concern in inferring a potentially sensitive attribute. So we'll talk about these through the course of the module. As with the other modules, I have provided a set of readings for this module, the only difference is uh, it's not required for you to read these module or read these these readings prior to reviewing the lecture. Uh, so you certainly will be able to uh, if you if you like that's no problem. But over the course of the module, we'll talk about things that'll come up in the readings uh, that may be useful to know. So the four readings, I, well, I understand are, are a lot. There's a particular uh, purpose for this. The first is that each one of these readings is uh, insight into different kinds of, of graph mining uh, techniques and graph mining problems. So the first one, a method for computing political preference among Twitter, Twitter followers. So this is an example of inferring node attributes. That's one type of, of mining task. There's another one on geolocation prediction in Twitter using social networks. Uh, so this is a, a good paper that looks at some of the different geolocation capabilities that people have developed for Twitter. Another instance of, of inferring node attributes, but geolocation is a super common task in graph mining, so it's important that you have some sense of what this means and how this works. Then we have a sort of seminal paper in link prediction in social media uh, from David Leibniz Nowell and John Kleinberg about inferring edge attributes and link prediction. So we'll talk about that. And then the last thing, we'll, the last area of, of your reading is about using subgraphs and motifs specifically to visualize signatures of social roles and online discussion groups. 
that give you good insight into the kinds of graph mining problems and techniques that might be used to solve them. All right, so I've given you some readings about this, but now we can talk about or define three main tasks in graph mining. So say we have a graph. Uh, the first kind of task is to learn something about the node. Uh, we'll talk about examples, but it could be political preferences. It could be all kinds of demographic information, but it's inferring or identifying some kind of attribute of the node. Another kind of graph mining task is learning about an attribute of an edge. And that could include whether that edge exists at all. And then the third kind of task in graph mining is understanding something about the larger network structure, specifically looking for subgraphs that repeatedly occur or occur more frequently than you may expect uh, and have particular patterns. So here we have this large spaghetti-like like graph, but you might see there are sort of recurring structures like this hub structure that we talked about before, or this ABC structure uh, that you could view as this sort of linear structure or as a, as a triangle. And we'll talk about that as well. So what kind of things may you do for, node, for mining node attributes? So you may try and infer demographic data about nodes in a graph. So it could be age, location, income, education, these kinds of things. You could use the network to infer something about political preference or something about a user's individual opinion. Uh, for political preferences, maybe are they liberal or conservative or are they Democrat or Republican based on their neighbors or based on the, node, the graph structure. Could infer different kinds, different kinds of types of nodes. Uh, so what social roles do they occupy in a particular community or neighborhood or how important are they? So you've already seen this through the centrality metrics that we talked about last time. Or you might look at interest profiles, trying to understand what sort of topics or, or interests or products a particular user may be interested in. Uh, so you can do things like recommendation. Now, there's an interesting question here about is it ethical to infer these sorts of attributes? So if, if I am not providing, if I'm a user and I'm not providing you this information directly via my profile or via some survey or some questionnaire, and you are inferring this information about me, uh, does that sort of take agency from me, the user? What does that, what does that mean? And in particular, we might have some protected attributes like gender and race where being able to infer them may make sense from just a, a simple tasking perspective, but how might you use what you would infer about gender or race? So race in particular is a protected class in the United States, so why might you be trying to infer race? Uh, since there's, there's definitely other work that has tried to infer, infer things like socioeconomic status or um, the likelihood that you will go to jail or stay in jail or recommit a crime or commit a new crime after you were released from jail, where race has a particular and troubling uh, role in those decisions. So is it even ethical to consider inferring these kinds of things about race? Likewise with gender, gender is a social construct and who are we, the machine learning people or the uh, graph mining people to be making decisions about the gender in of the users in the network when it's uh, a self-expression question. So there are all kinds of, of potential ethical issues here. All right, so for edge attributes and mining things about edge attributes, there are things that we could be looking at in terms of edge weights. So we've talked about tie strength, so you may want to infer something about how closely connected, or how strong is the connection between two nodes in the graph. Uh, related to this, you may think about connections in terms of trust. So we see that two people are connected in a social network, but we want to understand something about how much those two nodes trust each other for doing like chain of ownership or sending secure messaging from one node to another. This is a classical sort of edge attribute graph mining question for trust. Centrality of, of edges is something we talked about last time as well for a heuristic for doing modularity for identifying communities. So how central or important are particular edges to a graph? It's an important question if you were trying to identify edges that uh, if removed from the graph, either break the graph or separate the graph, uh, or take a connected graph and make it a bisected graph. You can do other things like pathfinding as well. Related to edge attributes, though, as I mentioned, is the link prediction task. So you're given some network, and you can mine that network to ask the question of, given two nodes where an edge does not exist, 
should that edge actually exist? Can we predict whether that edge will manifest or whether there shouldn't be an edge there? So one example of this is, say you have this triangle between myself, my wife, and, and our cat. Um, it's certainly plausible that my wife likes the cat much more than I do, so somewhere in the network we don't have a, a very clear follower relationship between uh, myself and my cat. So should this edge exist? So an interesting thing to note here is that we have these reciprocal directed edges between my wife and I and between my wife and our cat. So this tells you there's a potentially very strong ties between uh, each of these pairs of nodes except for between myself and my cat. So from social network analysis, actually what this is called is triadic closure. That really what you'd expect is if you have, if you see this structure, there probably or very likely is some connection between myself and my cat, considering there's a strong connection between myself and my wife and a strong connection between my wife and our, and our cat. But you might ask, why do we care about predicting links when they're not present in the network? What, why is this useful? So there are a number of reasons for this. So one is just the obvious one from uh, social media is for friendship recommendation. So a uh, network exists in which you are embedded and Twitter and Facebook and these kinds of, of networks are very interested in getting you more embedded into their networks that will make you more likely to go to their site and, and participate and engage if you have more connections. And by identifying users with whom you may share a connection, uh, either people who have just recently joined the network or people who are friends of friends uh, who might be good weak ties that you might be able to use later on, being able to predict who uh, and then recommend who to follow is a useful task uh, for these platforms. Also, you can look at this from a different perspective and talk about rather than a set of, of nodes that are all the same kind, you can look at this as a bipartite graph where you have people and board games uh, as, as an example. And you want to ask the question, should we recommend a particular board game to a particular person? And we might be able to use the network structure to identify this. Uh, so for example, on the right, you see there's a clear link between uh, myself and Mysterium. So I'm a huge fan of Mysterium. And an analyst may then ask the question, should there be a link between, or should there be a recommendation between my wife and Mysterium? Should the system recommend this game to my wife? And of course, obviously the answer is, is yes, but you could learn something about the structure of the network to make this prediction as well. Uh, so yes, yeah, this is useful for recommendations. You can do this to recommend all kinds of content. Ultimately, though, there are many reasons why links may not be apparent in your data. Uh, so why is the link protection problem interesting? So this is the hidden link problem. So if you imagine a uh, real world sort of large scale social network that is composed of many different kinds of actors from people who are generally angry to standard users to bots to uh, disinformation trolls to sock puppets, you might expect that legitimate or benevolent users will not try and hide any information from you. Uh, but there is definitely a reason for malicious actors to hide links uh, or make sure that links that, exi that exist in the real world are not manifested in the network. So for instance, here you have a particularly malicious user who actually controls a sock puppet account and a bot that he uses to amplify his voice. Uh, so you may try and use a link prediction algorithm to identify the connection between this user and these other two uh, users that are controlled by him, but do not appear to very clearly be him. And you may do this through uh, evaluating the similarity in their language or their connections or timing, all these different kinds of things, but identifying this link is valuable, even though it's not actually present and in fact is, is intentionally obscured from your network. Same thing if you're looking at disinformation agents. Uh, presumably disinformation agents are motivated by some sort of political goal, so they have to align their behavior in some way to, ad to advance that goal. Uh, so even though they may not interact directly via the network, there is some latent connection between them that governs their behavior. And you could identify these. And there's in fact a good bit of research about this kind of thing for identifying criminal networks or terrorist networks using a hidden link prediction. So what are some ethical concerns here? So first off is, is sort of the obvious question, especially when we talk about things like criminal or terrorist prediction, uh, where you pay some potentially very heavy cost uh, 
by associating a node with a terrorist group or a node with a criminal group using link prediction task or a link prediction algorithm. Uh, maybe you, the user or the developer don't, don't suffer that cost, but certainly the person who then you uh, ascribe or identify as, as a part of one of these heavily antisocial groups may then pay some significant penalty. So that, this is something to be very careful of. The third task for graph mining that we talked about is about subgraphs and motifs. So we've already kind of talked about this uh, in terms of subgraphs when we talked about community detection and clustering last time, uh, where looking for these communities within a given network is definitely a sort of subgraph kind of, kind of question, or trying to extract these subgraphs from a graph. But network motifs are slightly different. So in addition to the subgraph mining that, that we talked about last time and that may come up over the remaining modules, network motifs are a particular thing about patterns that recur much more frequently in real world networks compared to collections of random networks. So what this means is if you take a real world network and look at a bunch of different kinds of small structures in these, in these graphs, uh, maybe cliques of just a few handful of nodes, like three, four, five, six nodes, what kind of structure do you consistently see? Or what kind of shape do you see in these graphs? And oftentimes, motifs are statistically significantly more frequent in real world networks. So what kind of motifs are we talking about? What are we talking about when we say motifs? Well, we already talked about triadic closure. So that's this idea that, as I mentioned, when you have these three nodes and there's strong links between pairs of them, that in fact, what you should see is strong links between all three pairs of them. So you get a three, a three node clique. Uh, this is a very common kind of structure in, in real world graphs. You also have what's called feed forward networks where you have A and B are connected to each other and B is connected to C. And you can think of this as a transitive case where if A and B are connected and B and C are connected, then A can also send information to C. So you get this edge that goes from A directly to C. Again, this is another example of a triangle if you, re if you reform it. Uh, and then we've seen this before as well with the hub when we talked about uh, network centralization, that this kind of structure occurs often. This is one of the most centralized forms of a graph you may have. And the question about hubs and spokes that we talked about last time comes up and it's a good example of a motif as well. In fact, some of the research around motifs makes the suggestion that networks themselves really don't care about individual nodes, but really about these, these motifs, these sort of uh, meta-level collections of nodes. And this makes sense to a degree, right? So if you look at two cliques in a network, this clique one and clique two, really is it important to talk about each individual node in this clique or in these two cliques, or can you really just collapse all the elements of clique one and all the elements of clique two into two separate nodes where you have those elements in C1, those elements in C2, and we want to capture something about the connections between them, so we create an edge between C1 and C2 that captures this connection between A and C and that uh, the other link in between these two cliques, and then we do some weighting so we can weight this edge based on how many connections uh, do we actually see between these two these two cliques. And this really has the potential to cut down on the, on the complexity of our graphs. So this is the task that we'll talk about, uh, but one of the, the sort of overwhelming questions or, or overarching questions about graph mining is how does it work, especially in social media? What makes us able to learn things or infer things about graphs just by looking at the network structure or the, the adjacent nodes? And a core aspect about social media, and you see often in social network analysis, is homophily. And this is this idea that similar people are connected to one another way more often than dissimilar people, or a high, you have a high degree of social similarity. Now, if you're talking about networks, network theory or network science, sort of in a more general case, so you're talking about communication networks or transportation networks, uh, this idea of homophily has, has the term, or is known as assortativity. So what this means is just things that are similar are more likely to be connected. For social media, we talk about uh, nodes being people or communities and these people are, are connected more likely if they are more similar. So what does this mean for us or what are the drivers of homophily? So if you think about this from a large scale uh, of, of your social network, who, are the, who consists of 
the people you know in your network. Well, maybe it's the people you met in school, especially if you're younger, the primary way you have for, for interacting with new people who are not your family is through school. Uh, if you're in university, which all of you are, uh, by virtue of being in this class, then you have connections with your classmates. And for many, at least in the United States, this is potentially 15 to 20 years of your life of driving your social networks, which means that a lot of things that govern the sort of demographics about your friends are things like age. You're much more likely to know people who are the same age as you because you're, in the, you're in, interacting with people in the same grade, people in the same location as you, people with the same demographic information, or, or uh, parents with similar incomes because you went to the same school. Also location, so it's relatively unlikely for you to have many connections that sort of are, cr that cross the, the globe. You're much more likely to know people who are in some small physical proximity to you because those are the people with whom you interact or are much more likely to interact. Walking out of your apartment or walking down the street in your, in your hometown, your local neighborhood, you're more likely to, you have more opportunity to engage with people in that space than you do sort of globally. Although the internet has, has changed that to a degree, but that's why there are other drivers of Hoffley that we'll talk about. Others are family and extended family, um, especially with, with demographic information. Families generally don't speak very many different languages, so people who speak the same language or people with the same family are likely to speak the same language or have the same sort of education or income uh, background, all of these kinds of questions. But there's also things that are not sort of determined for you. There are things like your interests. Uh, people who have similar interests are also more likely to be friends because they're finding, they're, they're more motivated to find each other, either through communities locally or communities online. Especially stronger ties are likely to have more overlap in terms of, of space and, and interest. Uh, that's partially why you are friends in the first place. And there's other, other factors as well, like finances or socioeconomic status that can determine a lot of things. So the idea is that things that you may not necessarily be looking for in the network are allowing two nodes to be much more adjacent to each other as long as they are similar. So being similar in one way or a few small ways means that other sort of attributes are much more likely to be similar as well. But there are other drivers of similarity in social media besides homophily. In particular, there's influence. So you may think of this in terms of, of advertising or marketing or pop culture with celebrity information uh, or celebrity status where these people are, are able to exert a lot of social influence on their fans and followers, which also align their fans and followers to become more similar. So this idea of influence, besides the centralization concepts that we talked about last time, also denotes a process by which a particular influencer is influencing some population to behave more similarly or talk about similar kinds of things, like new songs that come out or new shows that come out or new brands to wear, all these kinds of things that make these individuals or these populations uh, more similar, more homogenous. But this is a double-edged sword, right? So you can still, if you're relying on homophily too much to make, to make your decisions, there are definitely, even if it works, which it's not always guaranteed to work, it's sort of a heuristic, uh, even if it works, there are still things that are concerning, right? So should negative attributes be considered examples of homophily? So if you grew up in a, in a lower income neighborhood in the United States, this means that you're more likely to have encountered people who are criminals. Uh, because of particular uh, structural injustices in the U.S. legal system and U.S. criminal justice system. Does that mean that you are also a criminal? Potentially not, uh, but homophily would suggest that if you grew up in close proximity to many criminals, that you would also be a criminal. Uh, and in some sense, that's that's an intuitive sort of response or, or an intuitive sort of potential potentially true thing. But there is a lot of concerns with relying on that. Uh, and you should be aware that, that these kinds of negative attributes may propagate as well uh, when you use these kinds of, of techniques. Also, because of the way these networks are structured, you have large groups of majority kinds of people. So in the United States, you may have 
uh, large groups of white individuals who are or Caucasian individuals who are on a social network, uh, meaning that the primary drivers that appear to show uh, community structure in these networks are not sort of minority information or information about minority types, uh, but information about the majority, meaning that minority information may get hidden or maybe drowned out. Uh, so is there a way that we should address that or is this a bias question that we need to that we need to be aware of? It's something that, that you should consider. And as I mentioned, especially with the example of criminal justice in the United States, when we rely on homophily, what we're essentially saying is the social structures that are embedded in society are giving us some information about how, how uh, similar people are in the network. But we know that society is biased, so are we also, by relying on this, encoding racist or ageist or some other sort of uh, biased or incorrect or unjust mechanic into our networks? And there are other kinds of biases as well that should be that, that you should consider. So now we'll talk about a few simple examples for doing graph mining. It can give you some, some structure for a general sort of graph mining task where you identify some task, maybe it's inferring political ideology or education or income or interest profiles, whatever your, your task is. And then you go to your network and you look for some set of nodes or people or vertices where you, have, you know that information, you know that value. Uh, maybe you know that from from self-reporting in the graph. So if you're doing geolocation, people telling you where they're located, or maybe people are saying, I'm interested in uh, topic X, or I saw and enjoyed movie Y, or I voted for this particular uh, politician. You can look for that information in the graph and create some sort of a core set of nodes that you have information about for this particular attribute you're trying to infer. Or you can go outside the graph. Um, political ideology is a good example of this because politicians exist in these graphs on social, me social media platforms, and you can actually l know a lot about their political stance and political ideology by looking at their uh, congressional voting records or a number of other sort of sources for this kind of information. But once you have this seed information, then what you can do is propagate it to its two neighbors. And we rely on homophily to tell us that, well, if one node is surrounded by neighbors who have a particular value for this attribute, then odds are that that node will also have that value for that attribute. Critically, though, you want to compare whatever thing you have learned from this to some external data source. It's important to note that there are many kinds of graph mining tasks and graph mining algorithms and problems for which graph mining is useful. So we'll go through some examples here. Uh, the first one is a, sort of a naive method for mining interests from your graph. Uh, so for instance, say you're looking at Reddit data or Twitter, Twitter data, and you build a graph of users. Now this graph may be people who have used the same hashtag or have posted in the same subreddit uh, or have in, in, engaged in some, in some similar kind of way. So once you have this graph, then you can run one of the community detection algorithms that we talked about last time on it, to sort of divide the graph into these clusters or, or communities uh, that capture some sort of signal in the network about how people group together. You can explore these communities in a qualitative way to understand what the communities are about. So for the case for, with Reddit, maybe you look at the most common subreddit uh, that appears or was posted to in that community or you look across all these edges and see, well, well, how many times did a particular subreddit appear in these edges? Uh, or in, in Twitter, you may look for the most common hashtag. Or in each one of these communities, you may look for the most influential user, or the user with the highest uh, centrality metric of some form. And you use that to sort of assess what these communities are all about. And then you can take whatever label you've identified for that, for that community and propagate it to all the nodes in that community. So if you're trying to fill out some attribute about interests, then maybe you collapse this interest information from the community level down to each one of these nodes. And there's value here because some of these nodes, uh, for instance, that the node on the left exists or has, has at least participated in the movie subreddit and the politics subreddit, or the node on the far right of the movie, sub, of the movie subreddit has also participated in the gaming subreddit. So it's useful to be able to break down these, this community structure so you can assign information about interests here. So that node that's in both 
movies and gaming, uh, suggests that that node participated and has interest in both of them, but is much more connected to the movies community, meaning they're potentially much more interested in movies than they are gaming, but they're interested in gaming more than they are politics. Now you can use this same approach to do a naive link prediction. So you have this structure of different communities, and now you can say, well, these two nodes are in the same community, so if I want to provide some mechanism to recommend links uh, between nodes, maybe I just try and link different nodes that are in the same community and say, well, both of you are involved and interested in gaming, so the two of you should be friends or there's some similar interest here. Another example is inferring ideology. A successful method is to look at a given network and say, well, we can identify some subset of nodes who have expressed their ideology in a very obvious way, either by saying who they voted for or their politicians and they have voting records. Uh, and we can look at this, well, this group of nodes have professed themselves to be Democrats. This group of nodes have professed themselves to be Republicans. And then we can look for Max neighbors and, again, rely on homophily in the way that I said before, where if a particular node is surrounded by nodes of a particular type, and you know that type for the neighbors, then homophily would suggest that you are more likely to be able to propagate that information to the neighboring nodes for who you do not know those the attribute values, and be able to say, well, all of your neighbors are Democrats, so it's more likely that you are yourself a Democrat. All of your neighbors are Republicans, so it's more likely that you yourself are a Republican. Likewise, for inferring a user's location, so we have some number of nodes in the graph where we know these people's location through their user profiles or through the, the things they've said or done, or we just know from their identity information, so they're maybe a public figure or a journalist or a celebrity, so we know where they are or know a lot more information about them than we do most other people in the graph. So then we can look for or build a new graph of neighbors based on strong ties. So we add some additional uh, information here that we're not looking for, we're not relying on weak ties because weak ties may be ties that go over long distances, but we know that strong ties are people are ties that have been around for potentially a long time or through a lot of interaction. And again, odds are, if you have these very strong, weak ties, or the stronger your tie to somebody, homophily would suggest the more similar you are. So we can rely only on, or we can say, we'll build a graph of only strong ties. So in the Twitter world, maybe this is a reciprocal friend-follower relationships. So you and I follow each other, uh, or you and I have both retweeted each other. And again, we can rely on this sort of propagation where for these nodes whose location we know, we then propagate that information out to uh, their neighbors. And we can repeat this in an iterative way and sort of propagate this information repeatedly, like we talked about with label propagation uh, last week. So this process is called geolocation. It is also a very active and popular area of research in social media. So then you can ask, should you or can you do this, this sort of inference? Uh, to identify gender or some other protected class? And generally the answer is yes, but you may ask also, should you? So there is definitely some research that shows uh, people of the same gender are more likely to interact or more likely to use the same platforms. Women tend to use Pinterest more than men. Men tend to use LinkedIn more than women. But you definitely have to answer this question about should you try and do this task, primarily because there are open questions about how you validate this information. So gender in particular is a thorny subject for doing this. Um, so there's a paper from Wendy Liu and Derek Ruth from McGill that talks about using first names as a way to infer gender in Twitter. And one of the important takeaways uh, in my view from their paper is that 66% of the users in the graphs that they studied did not have a name that had an associated gender you're missing the gender of a huge portion of your population. In fact, the, va the majority of your population, we should be sensitive to what that means and ask questions like, well, what sort of names might be left out? This may be names of people from immigrant families whose names are either less likely to show up in census records, which are often used for this kind of validation task, or names that uh, do not appear common enough or commonly enough to have associated gender information with them. So there's definitely opportunity for bias here. But this question of validation is, is a question that we, sh that we need to consistently come back to because when you talk about doing graph mining, 
uh, unless you're doing some very uh, unsupervised thing in the in the parlance of, of machine learning, or you're just looking for uh, clusters of, of, of nodes, and then you're going to do some qualitative assessment or evaluation or content analysis of those clusters, it's important that you have some sense about how you show that the results of your graph mining algorithm or the application of your graph mining technique uh, are reasonable results. So one way to do this is through cross-validation. Another one is, is through forecasting performance. So I'm giving you this information so you can leverage it for your assignment three. As I mentioned, there's external information that you can go and rely on. So one of the popular methods for this is, is to go look for other factors that you can then evaluate or compare whatever, whatever information you're constructing with this external information. Um, this is valuable for ideology in particular because we have good ideology information for uh, politicians, but not necessarily good ideology information or just because we have a po uh, pol political ideology information from Congress doesn't mean that we have political ideology information for the vast majority of people in the United States. Uh, but we can at least evaluate how well we're able to recover or infer ideology information for politicians. And if we can do that well, then we can at least have some amount of confidence that the ideology estimates we've made for other people, other non-politicians in our graph, are at least reasonable. Another method is through cross-validation, where you take your set of nodes that you know labels for, or for whom you know labels, and split that up into a set of training and test sets. So maybe you put some of your nodes into this small set of maybe 20% of your examples and make that your test set. You can validate against that set uh, for tasks that you perform on the uh, larger majority subset. So the idea is to train your model on some large subset and then evaluate your accuracy against your test set. And you can do this many times, in fact, to get a statistical estimate of how well you are doing for a particular for a particular task. Now that's all well and good if we have clear labels about a particular attribute that you're trying to infer. Uh, but what if that's not the case? And this is particularly important if we're talking about link prediction because for link prediction, uh, the network structure sort of is the network structure, and that doesn't necessarily tell you a lot about uh, how to validate that information. So how do we how do we do this? And the answer to this, or one answer to this, is through what's called forecasting. So you can take a given graph or a given network, and you can create some subgraph, an induced subgraph, meaning you take some subset of nodes from your graph and all the edges that are associated with that subset of nodes. And then you can train your graph mining technique on this subset or on this subgraph. And then you can apply it to the held out nodes and look for whether you were able to successfully recover or identify or predict uh, the links associated with the nodes that you held out. But there's an open question here about how do you know which nodes to delete. Uh, so certainly you can do this through just sort of random sampling, uh, but another way is through forecasting where you look at uh, the entire graph. So this is everything that we know about it, but then you can divide it up into sort of temporal slices or time slices and say, well, this is what the graph looked like today or this week. And we can compare what we what we learn about the graph today to how we know the graph will look tomorrow. Uh, or at least we wait a day and then we can recollect the graph and we can evaluate whether new edges in the graph were edges that we would have been able to predict or were we successfully able to predict any new edges that came with the new time slice. This idea of looking at graphs over time or how graphs change is called uh, dynamic graphs. And we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm particularly, this is a particularly interesting area that lets us look at time series data around graphs. But it's also, it's, it's a good way to evaluate methods for doing things like link prediction or anything that might change or evolve in your, in your network. So we've talked about different kinds of tasks. We've talked about different ways to validate them. Uh, we've talked about homophily and how that can be used in a lot of different ways. So that now you have some background when you go through and read these papers. What I want you to do as you read these papers, you don't have to read them super carefully, but for each paper I want you to, to consider the following. What is the mining task at hand? What are, what are the authors trying to infer about nodes in the graph? 
what were the seed set of nodes? Did they know something about some core set uh, before they, that they then leveraged in their mining task? How was information propagated to neighbors? Was it propagated to neighbors? How, how was this done? Is this through some homophily mechanism or was it through some, some other, uh, other method? And then how did the authors validate their results? How did they check to make sure that what they were inferring was reasonable and made sense? Now, as I mentioned, these are some very simplistic kinds of ways for doing graph mining. Uh, we don't have a lot of time in this class to talk about all the different ways you might mine a graph or all the different techniques for inferring node attributes or vertices or doing link prediction. And that's primarily because you know, we're trying to cover a lot and a number of you have very different backgrounds. Some of you may have background in machine learning. Some of you have may, may have background in more sort of qualitative assessment or qualitative analysis. So I want to give you a, a sample or an idea of what the general tasks are. What are the general problems that that are encountered when you're doing graph mining. But there are a lot of more sophisticated ways that you can do this as well. And so I'll give you some, some sort of uh, quick whirlwind view of what these may be. So the first is to look at graphs in terms of matrices and do some algebraic analysis to understand something about the nodes of the graph or the, vertice, the, uh, or the structure of the graph. And another is to look at the graph in, in terms of machine learning or from a machine learning perspective. From the perspective of matrix analysis, there are a couple of ways where we can look at this. All graphs can be represented using an adjacency matrix. And then we can look at the rows in the adjacency matrix as vectors. So here, the vector of this first element or the first node in our graph. And then you can do things like rank nodes by similarity. So you can evaluate sort of Euclidean distance between these different feature vectors or different rows in the in the matrix matrix and learn something about uh, well, what are the most similar nodes where similarity here is is about the neighborhood and then you can use this for link link prediction or you can use this for attribute analysis so again two nodes that are very similar in their adjacency matrix or their adjacency vectors are likely to be similar in other ways uh, and potentially should have links between them so are good candidates for recommendation. With matrices, you can get more sophisticated. So there's a whole area of research around matrix factorization or matrix decomposition, where you can take your adjacency matrix and decompose it into some factors, where you take your matrix A and decompose it into two submatrices, U and V. Uh, and then you can say, recover the matrix A by the product of matrix U times matrix V times the inverse of matrix U. There are others as well, singular value decomposition, LU decomposition, many other kinds of, of, of matrix factorization mechanics. And using these factorized versions, you can then evaluate new edge weights between the ith and jth node by taking the ith vector from U and the jth vector from U and combining them together through this mediating V, which provides essentially a low dimensional embedding or a different way of doing an embedding for this kind of structure. So, Relatedly, if all of the edge weights in your graph are non-negative, then you can use what's called non-negative matrix factorization. In fact, this kind of matrix factorization has been used to significant success in the Netflix prize or the Netflix competition, where you have sets of users and sets of movies, and you want to recommend movies to users uh, based on information that's in the adjacency matrix between users and movies. And this blog post details one of the winners of the Netflix prize using matrix factorization. As mentioned, you can also do this through machine learning. Uh, so some simple methods for this are, as I mentioned, you can take a row from your adjacency matrix, and then you can treat that as, as a set of features. So here for machine learning, you're maybe using some set of features and labels and some obje objective functions, and you can treat these rows in your adjacency matrix as features. Or maybe you have some external set of information about these nodes and you can treat them as feature vectors as well. And then you can use some information from the graph, like the edges that exist in the graph or your known labels from your seed data and use those to train some machine learning classifier that can then predict additional things about your graph. There's many kinds of algorithms for, or many kinds of machine learning approaches for this. Uh, a simple approach that I've used is to decompose a 
politicians' behavior into the domains that they share. So here we get two politicians of Democrat and Republican affiliation, and we can take the domains that they share, which is a very clear network structure, and we can learn some model from them using machine learning. And through this, we can predict that Elizabeth Warren is more liberal and Lisa Murkowski is more conservative, using information that when you see it makes sense, like Fox News is a more conservative news site, so Lisa Murkowski is posting more or sharing more content from Fox News, gives you signal that she's likely to be more conservative, or Elizabeth Warren posting a lot from Vox and New York Times gives you signal that she's more liberal, and we can encode that into a machine learning model. Another popular area of research in, in machine learning is to take these adjacency matrices that are square with the number of nodes in your graph as the as the rows and columns. So it's generally going to be a very sparse graph for most social networks because people don't know everybody in the world. And you can embed that into a lower dimensional space where you can create a new graph or a new matrix structure that has the same number of rows as you have nodes in the graph but has far fewer columns. And this gives us a more dense representation. And we can use this dense representation or low dimensional embedding to learn attributes or to predict attributes about our nodes uh, based on their neighbor's neighborhood structure or uh, their location in the graph. So there's a whole area of research here called node embeddings uh, that if you want more information about this, there's a really nice tutorial about this from the SNAP lab at Stanford where they talk about node embeddings and what this means. The last thing I'll mention is that uh, you're not required to implement anything about, about graph mining from scratch. So certainly the methods that I showed you above about uh, propagating community structure to the nodes in the community, these kinds of things, those are well within bounds for your assignment three. Uh, but note that Network X also has implementations for this. So it has a node classification package. Uh, one of the things it supports is the harmonic function for doing classification. There's uh, one other as well, so you can definitely use this. Uh, or other kind of methods that you may find interesting uh, to explore what you can learn from the graph structures in the data that you've collected for assignment two. Now we've gone over a number of these different learning objectives. You should be able to define and use homophily to extract insights from the graph, uh, talk about the three different graph mining types that we've discussed, implement and evaluate graph mining techniques, talk about what that implementation might look like and how you might evaluate it, and then explain some ethical concerns around inferring potentially sensitive attributes. So that's it for this module. As I mentioned, we didn't go too deeply into many of these things because my primary goal was to introduce you to some problems in graph mining and give you some high-level examples or some, some sort of naive examples and give you some reading with more sophisticated sort of deeper examples.